Michael Layton. Michael has been a resident of Ward 19 and has lived in the Trading Square now area for the past 25 years. Before being elected on October 25, 2010 to serve as one of Toronto's youngest councillor, Mike worked for political change from the other side of the table as an environmental leader and a community organizer. As a deputy outreach director for the Environmental Defense, one of Canada's leading environmental groups, he championed a variety of successful initiatives including the Green Energy and Green Economy Act, green building standards, water conservation, and source water protection. Mike holds a LEEDS uh, accreditation, leadership in energy and environmental design, in addition to earning a master's in environmental studies, which is, a, <coughs> sorry, with a focus of citizen participation in urban planning. These qualifications follow his BA in political science and environmental management. Mike's volunteers accomplishment includes serving as vice president of the board of directors of Freshwater Future as the Lake Ontario board member for Great Lakes United. He served on the Environment, Can uh, on the Environment Canada Great Lakes Canadian Advisory Panel for the negotiation to amend the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and on the Great Lakes Commission Wind Collaboration Steering Committee, advising this international organization on wind power development in the Great Lakes. Mike also worked for six years as a manager of a popular downtown restaurant where he learned firsthand the challenge of small business ownership and the role the city of Toronto plays in fostering entrepreneurship. Son of NDP leader and former city councillor Jack Layton, Mike has been active since an early age in a variety of issues and causes, including fundraising for the White Ribbon Campaign and to end male violence against women and working with special needs children. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Layton.
first, I'd like to talk about slide two. Uh, why are we, in fact, even discussing this matter? If you didn't hear about it during the election, I certainly didn't even mention it in any of the campaign literature I put around. I didn't hear any mayors talking about it in the debates uh, when we elected our last provincial, pro uh, uh, municipal or provincial government. But all of a sudden, Toronto's been put in this position that we're going to have to decide whether or not we, we host the casino. I'd also like to talk a little bit about uh, how we're going to decide on whether or not to host a casino and, and what that process will look like. Finally, some of the issues that have arisen to this point, uh, what we can expect the, the potential impacts might be, a little bit from what the, uh, what the city manager and some of the consultants are saying, but also what some of the, the, the facts and the research that I've undertaken have come up, and some of that's similar to what, what's been mentioned here already, uh, anecdotally and also uh, empirically. So, and then finally, I got a couple questions I want to put out to you. We'll do a little Q&A after, but there's a couple things that, that I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to hear from for sure. So the first, why are we being asked? Or why is Toronto debating? Because we've been asked. We've been asked by the provincial government through the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation uh, in their modernization strategy if Toronto would, will host a casino. And the Ministry of Finance, as part of the way to fill in parts of their budget, uh, has said, hey, we're going we're gonna to build a bunch more casinos. This seems to be working. Some of our casinos, well, they're not doing very well now, so we've got to find new customers. We've got to find a, a, a larger base to, 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 to take our money from uh, in order to make this work. So they've determined 29 zones that they intend to have gaming facilities in. Um, 29 zones. Uh, and off, there's currently venues operating in 24 of those 29 zones, which either will be upgraded or will uh, or, or new new uh, establishments could be could be put in. And then there's five more that don't have uh, casinos yet, and this being one of them. So the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a map of the of, of a bit of the GTA to give you a, give you an idea. It's not just Toronto that's. That, that's being looked at. We won't have the only casino in the region. It's actually a lot of municipalities that have been asked to, to host these casinos, partly because proximity is such an important part of how much casinos bring in. They want to have a large population in close proximity to their casino. So we see uh, Pickering and Ajax have looked into it. Markham is part of C1. Uh, the Woodbine is C2. Uh, Milton and, 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 Hill, and uh, Halton Hills also in there. But what we've actually been hearing from most municipalities is that where they're being proposed casinos or, or where they're suggesting these casinos should come, the, the municipalities are actually pretty skeptical about this. They're, they're shying away from it. Uh, Markham, for instance, at this point is, is, is a no. So whenever they try to scare us and say, well, if you don't take it, Markham's just going to take it. Well, no. Markham said no. Uh, they, they've already said no to a downtown casino in, 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 in Hamilton. And so these are, other, other municipalities are grappling with this same question. Next slide, please. And this is just a closer up version of, of Toronto, uh, the C1 uh, areas of Toronto, which include part of Mississauga to, to this point, uh, our friend Hazel out in Mississauga, the institution of, uh, of, of Mayor Hazel, uh, has, has said that, that, that she wouldn't want a casino. Uh, they haven't put, a, put it to a vote yet, so we'll wait on that. Uh, Markham, which has said no, and then the, uh, the waterfront, central section of downtown Toronto. Next slide, please. Um, how will Toronto decide? Well, the OLG first is, needs to get municipal consent. So it needs the city council to say, yes, we're going to take a casino. Now, it's unclear whether or not the city can put conditions on. It's, it, the, the, the OLG modernization website says very clearly that we cannot put conditions on. That, in fact, the OLG will decide where the casino goes in the end with the private sector through an RFP process. Also, the city of Kingston, which tried to put a condition on their, uh, on their approval, have actually, the RF, RFP that was put out by the provincial government just weeks later made no mention of the condition when they were asking and pre-approving people who would take that on. So that's, uh, th that's still unclear. In 2012, the provincial government actually changed the regulation around siting casinos so that there's no municipal referendum. Until that point, there was a regulation that says you had to have a referendum. Well, last time Toronto voted on whether or not to host a casino, you can only guess what happened, 70% of us. So we, there's, no, there's no requirement for that anymore. Uh, finally, the, the, the one caveat about the, this election is that the, the, the act that governs the OLG says you have to have some kind of municipal consultation strategy. So that's what we, we're, we've been going through at the City of Toronto. Next slide, please. Um, in November 2012, a report was, was put forward to the uh, to the executive committee of the city of Toronto.
Toronto. It was actually the result of a motion that I put forward months earlier and a, and a motion that Adam Vaughan put forward, uh, Councillor Vaughan put forward months earlier, uh, mine about a possible uh, casino at Ontario Place and Councillor Vaughan's about uh, the possibility for a referendum. That turned into a report back to, to the, uh, the executive committee, the mayor and his top, uh, his top supporters, which also uh, included a report from Ernst & Young which I'll get into a little bit in a second, but needless to say, that report was written based on advice given to them by the casino industry. Then in January, the city of Toronto hosted four town halls. Uh, there were two downtown and others uh, across the city. Very well attended, lots of people out, uh, mostly on, on, on the no side, uh, but there was, uh, there was a good dialogue done there. That will get put, in, there was also an online survey that took place between January and March. All of that information, is gonna get pulled into a report that comes back to executive committee. Now, we were supposed to see that, that report at executive committee next week, but uh, for one reason or another, it's not exactly clear. We, the, the report's not done yet, uh, and so there'll be a special executive committee or we'll be at the, uh, at the next executive committee. That's an opportunity for the public to go to make deputations, to go and speak to the executive committee about their concerns. The next time it comes back, it'll go to council, and, and there, uh, you, we've got to be pushing other councillors to, 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 to change the, or to, to vote a particular way uh, because there's no opportunity for public, uh, uh, public deputations at that stage. And we don't know when that's going to happen. A note on sources. I've, I've actually found that it's, it's been incredibly difficult finding reliable information about this stuff because what we're show, what, what's published in the newspaper, what's shown in flat, flashy brochures that, to try to create this casino mania, uh, what's, what's put out in the advertisements that the OLG has on television and, and, and has on billboards and has on uh, in movie theaters, uh, it's difficult to get the right information there. For instance, the Ernst & Young report, who are, 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 are qualified folks, went out and did the research, but they only consulted people and their numbers only came from folks related to the casino industry, folks that would benefit directly from a casino being in Toronto. And they didn't consult the, the folks at, the, uh, at, 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 at CAMH, which are, are North American leaders in addiction research. They weren't consulted on that. They also, they, they then uh, put forward this report that was based on numbers, assumptions of numbers about how much the city would get, that even the OLG said, well, those are, those are a little way off. So their numbers in the report need, needed to be questioned. Uh, finally, I, I, I've recently found in, 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 a, in a fairly reliable study that isn't funded by the casino industry a list of the contacts between these, uh, these, these think tanks that pop, like the Journal of Gambling Studies and Gambling Law Review, and how, and which, which shows how they're connected and funded by the casino lobby. And so their conclusions need to be treated with some skepticism. If, and, and in fact, the, the folks at the University of Illinois said, we won't consider because, they, because they're funded by the casino industry. We will only consider publications that are not. I'd like to think that's probably a more reliable source when they're not supplied by the size that stands to gain billions of dollars. So first on the economic impacts. Uh, the, 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 the claims, the, the first claim that, that, that many of uh, the casino uh, proponents make is the jobs. And they, they throw out wild numbers. The, the, the latest number of 10,000 jobs is, is, is quite a bit larger than is even listed in the Ernst & Young report. Um, and, and, and the rate of pay is, is almost 50% higher than what is listed in the, uh, in, in the Ernst & Young report. Uh, so these are, most of the jobs are actually in temporary construction jobs that you see a lot of going on in this neck of the woods. Um, and then there, there are uh, 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 some permanent service industry jobs, but as we hear, when times turn rough, those, those are also uh, uh, up for uh, uh, th those numbers and rates are up for discussion. The possible revenue sharing with the city. Right now, the city of Windsor and the city of Niagara Falls, for their trouble for hosting a casino, get around three million, three million bucks each. So that's a far cry from the 250 million the Ernst & Young report says Toronto's gonna get. And if you know, if you've lived in Toronto long, you know anything about uh, Ontario politics, you don't give Toronto that much of a sweetheart deal uh, that compared to other, other cities in, 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 in the province. That's just a political reality of Ontario politics. Um, now, we'll probably get more than three million. They are renegotiating some of these deals with cities, but they're certainly not in that 50% share range. Uh, even the OLG says they're closer 
to, 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 to 50 uh, million a year, uh, which isn't far, that far from what we already get from the race track. Um, the impact that city will, I, I, will, the impact of the image will have on tourism. Some folks argue it's going to bring all these tourists in. Sometimes those numbers are inflated, but then there's others that argue, you know what, it sets a bad, uh, it, it sets a bad image of our city. And that's not what brings people to Toronto. Because what brings people to Toronto is Toronto's great art scene. Toronto's great culinary scene. We actually have a fantastic culinary scene. If you, if you don't know, I've been other places in the world. It's a, one of the world's greatest. And that's, that's what folks are worried are going to take away from. Uh, th it's been mentioned that casinos will cannibalize uh, local businesses. That's something I firmly believe. When you have someone paying a little bit off your ticket to see, to see a show in the entertainment, as well as paying uh, a little bit on your drink, you're more likely to go there. And the only reason why they're doing that is to keep you gambling. So you'll spend the rest of your money there. The, the number that Ernst & Young throw around, again, what's likely highly inflated based on the tourism numbers, is that a billion dollars a year will come out of the local economy and go directly into casino. So that's coming out of when people are spending their, their entertainment dollars on King Street or up on Queens. Uh, our, our friends at the West Queen, West BIA have come out opposed to this because they know the impacts that it'll have on their, on, on their businesses and their main streets. They see those impacts in, uh, in, in, in other cities. Uh, uh, Atlantic City, most uh, most noticeably, with a massive loss in, in local business downtown as a result of that. Um, the impact on land use is an investment in Toronto. We've had some of the largest landowners in the city come out against the casino, saying this will not be good for our business. This will not be good for for our, our, the retail, the large format retail in the city, and it won't be good for development that, that continues to drive construction uh, and. and and finally, it's the precarious financial position of a lot of the casinos. When you start to do a little digging, they, they posted some annual reports just recently, the two major ones that are coming to Toronto. They're not doing very well because they have an ever-shrinking client base, kind of like the smoking company, that they, they're, they're losing their, their, their base. And so that's why they're looking for these new markets, new places to gain massive investment. Uh, MGM had to knock down a building in their, in their last development in, in Las Vegas. First, they didn't build it as high as they should have. Then they had to knock down a good portion of it. Um, it wasn't selling, it wasn't structurally sound. And so this, like, this is what's going on with these casino companies. They, they owe more money than they own or that they have an asset, which if you and know anything about business, it's a bad way to do it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just, this was a picture from Windsor, I thought it was just illustrating that, what, what it could do to some of our downtown streets. Next slide. Um, the city planning imp implications. Traffic seems to be the one that most people want to talk about these days with all the transit <coughs> traffic uh, campaign. Uh, the, the proposal for MGM at, uh, at, uh, at Exhibition Place, 12,000 parking spots. So the, the, the results of, uh, of, of, of some of the studies that have come out from the University of Toronto Transit Planners are those will cycle two to three times a day. Thousands of cars in this neighborhood on the road every hour at peak. Thousands of more. So if you think traffic is bad now on Strawn, on Lakeshore, on the Gardner, imagine thousands of more cars on the roads every day. Um, the parking implications. Some of the proposals that are coming out for casinos say, well, we only need a couple thousand spots. There's parking in the neighborhoods around it. <laughs> Have you ever tried to park downtown? <laughs> you ever tried to park around a convention center? Ain't happening. And it's gonna hurt, that's going to hurt local businesses more than it's going to hurt the casino. People drive around the block to go to the uh, the land values in surrounding areas. I was actually brought to this to, to a study from from the, uh, the head of the Liberty Village Resident Association emailed to me when there was threat uh, or, or rumors of it at Ontario Place that it can actually decrease local property value uh, quite considerably and noticeably, which means the biggest investment of your life is going to go down in value, and that's not only bad for for, for you. That's actually really bad for the city because. Your, your property value has a good relation to our taxes on you. And, and, and the, the connection there is quite, quite firm. And so if we, we, we could be losing money just straight off the top of all of this because we can't collect as much money from you through taxes, which is, is, is at least a more equitable way of sharing the burden uh, of, of, of delivering services. Um, and, and again, the surrounding land use is the impact that we could, fit, that, that we could face and we're hearing from uh, some of the local landowners that own the larger pieces of land in Liberty Village that, that, that actually employ so many. Next slide. This isn't to scale, or it's not an exact replication of what this parking lot will look like, but this, this you can just imagine
imagine what 12,000 parking spots look like. And next slide, please. That translates directly into more cars on the road in the surrounding area. Next. Uh, finally, and, and again, I'll try to be very brief on this, is the, the health and, and social factors. The first one being that uh, the, the socioeconomic costs. The, the best estimates, and again, I'm going to reference this. This is a, the U.S. International Gambling Report, um, which isn't available online, unfortunately, or I would have, would have shared it with my colleagues, but I have asked the city manager to get a copy so he includes part of some of these statistics. But one of the most startling statistics is the cost. That is $3 of cost for every $1 of gain. You can, like that, in a cost-benefit analysis, that's a fail every day of the week. Um, the next is, uh, is, is addiction. And we've heard the Toronto Medical Officer of Health report saying addiction rates would double. We've heard 30 to 40% of the revenue from casinos is actually generated from those with addiction. Uh, and that they have this concept called play to extinction. And this is a lot about how the slots work and how they trick you into thinking you're winning. So you'll actually stay at the machine until you're done, until you have no more money. That's the way the machines work. They're, they they They've tested these. They're tried and true. That's how it works. Uh, and finally, a, a very startling statistic is that this is the fa gambling is the fastest growing uh, addiction amongst our youth. Now, why else would they want to put a casino in downtown Toronto around a place where a lot of people are getting their first house, getting buying their first condo? Because they're trying to rope. This isn't youth like 16. This is this is young people. They're they're trying to rope in this next generation. We've heard, we've heard a bit on crime. Uh, while our, the, the, the Toronto police chief says there's no correlation, can't find a correlation between it, there's clear data in, in reports coming out of the U.S. that suggest there's a strong connection both in organized crime and in, 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 in property crime and, and assault. Um, bankruptcy rates, depression, and, and, and even suicide are, are often reports that come um, out of communities that, that host casinos. This is, there's a, a, a very unfortunate and disturbing statistic around suicide that because there's they, they, they haven't pinpointed a correlation between casinos and suicide is because they never record the suicide death to the casino itself or to the cause of the suicide. They record it to their home. So even if they commit suicide in a parking lot, it's recorded at their home. And they don't do the research to say that was a gambling addicted suicide. There was a gentleman in the who had finished gambling at the MGM Casino in, uh, in, in, in Detroit, went to another casino after losing uh, like $20,000. He, he was a police officer, um, a deputy sheriff or something like that. Um, he walked into the other casino, and it's called, it was the Greek Town Casino, and he gambled away more of his money and then tried to kill himself right there at the table, which is incredibly disturbing. And those stories, uh, they, they continue to come out This was just an illustration of them, them roping it in. Next slide, please. So these were three of the questions that, well, I guess the third question is still a question. It's just meant to be rhetorical. Um, the first one being, I'd like to hear what, as, as the local community, the closest community to one of the, uh, one of the sites, what your concerns are, uh, what <coughs> questions you'd still like answered, what questions you think are still out there that I should be asking, that I should be asking at executive committee, that I should be asking in before the report comes out, that I should be doing research on. Um, and then finally asking, uh, have, have you, well, this is a sign, but I just wrote it off before I came here, so that's okay. Um, go and sing a petition. No, I go, if you go online and sign a petition, I, it, it, this is what's gonna start drawing folks in. If you haven't been part of a grassroots movement before, it's fantastic, it feels great. If you've never been political before, it feels great. And hopefully, if we can convince enough of, of these of these other councillors, you're all my residents, so are most of you. Yeah. Who's a resident in a local neighborhood? Lift up your hand. You're my resident. You know where I stand on this. Um, I would encourage you though to sign the petition and send it out to your friends. Send it out to your friends who live in North York. Send it out to your friends that live in the Tobacco. Send it to your friends who live in Scarborough. Send it to your friends that, that, that live out of the country. <laughs> send, it, send it to your friends so that they can also speak out and say, Toronto, 